Good evening, everyone. I'm Winston Tabb, the Sheridan Dean of University Libraries and Museums at Johns Hopkins. I'm very happy to welcome so many of you here this evening for this wonderful evening with Catherine Eden. And it's probably the last time I'll call her Catherine because she's Kathy to me. Uh, tonight's event is sponsored by the Friends of Libraries, which is, we think, the oldest such organization in the United States. Been in existence for about 85 years, really uh, another way which Hopkins was a great pioneer. And the wonderful things that the Friends of Libraries enable us to do for the faculty and students of Hopkins is something for which we're extremely grateful, including events like this this evening. Uh, if you're not a friend of the library yet, there's always a chance to do that. We would be happy to have even more members. We have about 600, I think, now, many of them in the Baltimore community, because we like to think of Hopkins as being really of Baltimore and the, our libraries as being for the people of Baltimore, as well as for the faculty and students of Johns Hopkins. I'm also pleased to say that this evening, for the very first time, people will be joining us online via the university's Ustream channel. This is the first time that we've actually tried to do a webcasting of one of our events. So we welcome all of you who are with us here tonight in the normal fashion, and all of you pioneers who may be listening to me or seeing me now. And we'd be happy to have feedback from either of you, particularly for the people joining us tonight remotely. So as I said, our speaker tonight is Bloomberg Distinguished Professor Kathy Eden, who holds joint appointments in the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Prior to her arrival at Johns Hopkins, Kathy was on the faculty at Harvard University, and she's also taught at Rutgers, the University of Pennsylvania, and Northwestern, from which she also earned her PhD in sociology. Kathy is a trustee of the Russell Sage Foundation and a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Advisory Committee for the Poverty Research Centers at Michigan, Wisconsin, and Stanford. She's a founding member of the MacArthur Foundation-funded Network on Housing and Families with Young Children and a past member of the MacArthur Network on the Family and the Economy. In 2014, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. Kathy Stutters studies poverty through ethnographic observations, in-depth interviews, and mixed method approaches to the domains of welfare and low-wage work, family life, and neighborhood contacts. She's explored key mysteries about the urban poor, and her work has convinced many in the poverty research community that deep insight into the lives of the poor requires both surveys and systematic qualitative uh, explorations. At Hopkins, one of her most important roles currently is in directing our 21st Century's initiative, which is an effort on part of the entire university to develop and test solutions for fostering economic growth, improving schools, reducing violence, addressing health issues, cultivating the arts, and revitalizing Baltimore and other cities. But tonight, she's here to talk with us about her latest book, which I know many of you bought and you'll be able to buy afterwards if you didn't have a chance to get it before, called $2 a Day, Living on Virtually Nothing in America, which Kathy wrote with Michigan's Luke Schaefer. The book has been widely praised in both the national and international press, and in fact, the New York Times called it an essential book and, really important, a call to action. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my great colleague and friend, Kathy Eden. Great to be here with you all. Uh, I'm 10 weeks into this book tour, and I'm going completely without notes, so uh, this could get interesting, uh, but hopefully uh, just interesting enough without getting too interesting. Uh, this book is very much uh, a Baltimore story, and I'm going to tell you the story of how the book began. I think every project has sort of a ground zero, an essential moment where the initial idea is hatched. And um, I was teaching at Harvard, but had been involved in a very long-term follow-up of families who had 
I had very young children and were living in public housing in the mid-1990s. And along with a very large research team, we'd been following these families and their children. It came to 2010, and uh, we got additional funding to follow up on what were now the young adults of these households. So kids from very, very disadvantaged origins. Think uh, children of the wire, if you've seen uh, that, that show. Many of, of those kids actually uh, grew up in, in uh, Lexington Terrace and, and the places that you saw on the wire, many of which are, uh, almost all of which are actually gone now. Uh, and uh, as I, you know, was um, going from household to household interviewing these young people, uh, I had kind of an amazing experience. I, um, I ended up one day in the Latrobe Homes. Uh, for those of you who know Baltimore, it's right along Madison Avenue there, kind of tucked in the shadow of the prison. And uh, there, a young mother named Ashley uh, was kind of talking to us, rocking her newborn. Uh, you know, if you looked around the apartment, you would notice that there was hardly any furniture, only a table with just three legs, so propped against the wall to keep it upright. A single chair, so I was sitting on the floor, and, and Ashley was sitting on the chair uh, with the baby. Uh, you know, so when you see no furniture in the household, you get worried. There were um, uh, four adults and one child living in this household. Um, I also noticed uh, that there was no food in the household. You know, as I was sitting there, I was looking right up into the cupboards, and I could see there was no food, and more worryingly, no baby formula. Then I noticed that, that Ashley was really visibly unkempt. Um, she looked depressed, and in fact, she was having a hard time uh, supporting her baby's head as she rocked her. So uh, this was sort of alarming, right? Now, it turned out that way back at the beginning of my career, I had spent six years traveling the country interviewing low-income single mothers about their budgets, mostly uh, welfare recipients, recipients of the old welfare program that existed prior to 1996, aid to families with dependent children. Uh, and because of that experience uh, of asking so many single mothers, uh, over 400 single mothers, about their budgets, I have a little calculator in the back of my head. It doesn't help me balance my checkbook, uh, but you know it, it's there. So um, I asked Ashley what I'd asked these hundreds of welfare mothers I had interviewed uh, for my first book, Making Ends Meet. Um, how do you make ends meet? And and what I learned from Ashley really stunned me. So I had. I'd interviewed uh, low-income single mothers uh, pre-welfare reform, and then I'd gone on you know, to study other things. I'd written a couple of books uh, with various co-authors on the family. I'd written a book on uh, the full-time, full-year working poor. And so this was kind of my first return to sort of the just plain poor. And Ashley, of, of course, told me she had no cash at all coming into the household. Uh, she had, no one in the household had a job. Uh, no one was getting uh, welfare, now called TANF, or Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. I think the local name is, anyone know it, TDC or TADC? Anyway, no one was getting welfare. Uh, no one was even getting food stamps in the household. So uh, a thought sort of occurred to me. Could it be that in the aftermath of the 1996 welfare reform, which of course uh, got a lot of people to work, which is a good thing, that we had an unintended hidden consequence as well. Uh, could it be that a group of poor people had sort of arisen in the United States right under our noses, uh, that were experiencing a poverty so deep that none of us even knew uh, that it existed? Now, what happened the next day uh, was, I think, equally compelling to the first time I met Ashley. Uh, we gave Ashley $50 at the conclusion of our interview, which researchers often do. But we also invented a ruse to come back the next day, just to make sure she and the baby were OK. So imagine <laughs> our surprise when, uh, returning the next day, uh, we were met at the door by Ashley. Uh, her, her countenance was just visibly different. Uh, she had gone and gotten a home perm, and she had she'd done her hair. She looked great. She had uh, walked down Broadway uh, to the Goodwill. Many of you know the Goodwill down in, in Fells Point. And she had gotten a new pantsuit. And she was actually wearing this pantsuit. And she had deposited the baby with her mother and was on the way out uh, to look for a job. So it was as if uh, for this cashless woman, $50 was really the difference between her 
uh, sitting around home depressed, uh, really hopeless, and, and finding the wherewithal, the drive to move forward. So again, uh, it did occur to me that perhaps uh, living in a virtually cashless state was especially uh, meaningful in the, in the world's most advanced capitalist society. After all, in many third world societies, people live without cash, but there's a rich barter economy, and much of the economy is actually run uh, without uh, reference to cash. So anyway, I finished the study, which was actually not about either one of these things, and I returned to Harvard, and um, uh, one morning, Luke Schaefer, a brilliant young uh, data nerd, showed up in my office. And uh, it turns out that I had sponsored him to be a visiting professor at Harvard, and I had completely forgotten he was coming. Uh, so I had to quickly cover for my confusion and found myself telling him the story of Ashley. Now, I did remember enough about Luke to remember he was one of the nation's expert in the one uh, government data set who could, that could offer us the best answer as to whether uh, this was a thing. Uh, there was a group of folks living virtually cashless in America, uh, and whether this group had, had, in fact, existed prior to welfare reform and whether it had grown. And uh, this survey, in case you're a data nerd yourself, is called the Survey of Income and Program Participation. So it captures more of the income of the poor than any other data source. Uh, so uh, he said, I have just the algorithm on my computer. I just had to fix a few things. I'll be back. Uh, my memory is uh, he said I'll be back the next day. Uh, he says it was a week later. Uh, whatever version you believe, um, his results, I think, stunned us both. Uh, what we found is that if you looked at the number of households with minor children reporting cash incomes uh, that, uh, virtually nothing, and we chose an arbitrary uh, uh, you know, cutoff, $2 per day, because uh, every line is arbitrary, and it's better to borrow someone else's arbitrary line than your own. And of course, this is a World Bank uh, line often used to measure poverty in the developing world. Uh, in any case, we found uh, that, that in 1996, on the eve of welfare reform, we had about 660,000 such families in the United States. Uh, but by 2011, that number had grown uh, to 1.5 million households with 3 million children. Uh, if you want to know whether that's big or small, uh, that's uh, more children than we rescue uh, from poverty. Uh, with the $70 billion we spend on tax credits every year. So it's a relatively big number. Now, uh, finding this group, uh, finding out about the existence of this group in some ways raised as many questions as it did answers, right? How is it that uh, this group uh, had arisen? Uh, what were sort of the contributing factors? How did people survive on $2 per person per day? I'm sure that's what brought many of you here. And what are the long-term consequences for families and children? Now, of course, uh, being at a school of public health, that's one of my hats here uh, at Johns Hopkins University, we know that it's critical uh, uh, that we understand the long-term impacts of children. For example, if you're raised in a household eating nothing but ramen noodles, as many of our families do, what happens to kids' brain development as a result in their long-term uh, cognitive uh, development? So we decided uh, that although we had uh, numbers in hand, we were going to return to the field and put skin on these numbers to begin to develop hypotheses about some of these questions. Uh, so we began with, uh, you know, I had fallen in love with Baltimore at this point, but I didn't realize how deep my passion would become. Uh, so I was thinking, what's the quintessential city in America? Well, it must be Chicago. Uh, so we began in Chicago. Um, and, and indeed, there is a clustering of the $2 a day poor in our cities. We also wanted to find a city uh, that had been a real boom town prior to the war in poverty, but it hit the skids. So kind of had a sharp downward trajectory. Uh, that landed me uh, for three summers in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, an amazing city. Anyone from Cleveland here? OK, I have a t-shirt that said, Cleveland is my Paris, and I believe it with all my heart, <laughs> although I may be a bit of an optimist. Uh, you can get one at the, you know, you can get t-shirts at the museum, just in case you want one of your own. Uh, we also develop sites. Uh, in a place that had been extremely poor during the war on poverty, but had since uh, experienced an upward trajectory, and we chose 
uh, a piece of Appalachia called Johnson City, Tennessee. Uh, Eds and Meds have really brought this part of Appalachia up in ways that have not been true of much of Appalachia, especially just over the line into Kentucky, where very deep pockets of poverty remain. And then we wanted to find the poorest place in America. And of course, uh, you can all tell me without me having to tell you what that is. Uh, we've been spending <clears throat> time over the last three years uh, traveling to both Johnson City and to, and to the Mississippi Delta. And if you haven't been to the Delta, it is a, it is a soul jarring uh, experience. So, uh, you know, we, we spent time with 18 families. We, we identified, we, with our first test of our hypothesis was to see if we can actually find people who fit the profile. And, and we found that these folks were perilously easy to find. And then we wanted to follow them over time to really chart what their lives were like. Uh, as we were doing this, um, and I'm going to, you know, read for you in just a second so you can get a sense of the flavor of the book. And the book, it really is about the lives of eight of these 18 families, very in-depth portraits. Uh, it reads like a novel, um, uh, but I, hopefully you won't forget it uh, like many of us forget novels because the portraits really are, are um, they're searing. Uh, it, but, but we were continuing to do our quantitative work, and I'll just tell you a, a few sort of little nuggets from that before I read. Uh, first, um, half of the $2 a day poor are white. And part of that is that $2 a day poverty tends to be concentrated in rural areas. Okay, whereas the other, uh, there's a quarter that are African American and about a quarter that are Latino. Um, about a third of the $2 a day poor are married, uh, whereas the other two thirds are unmarried. Uh, these are not a long-term class of dependents. When we follow children in $2 a day households over the course of a year, what we can see uh, is that although the average spell is more than seven months, 70% of $2 a day households have at least one adult earner. These are very much people hanging on to the ragged edge of work. These are people who think of themselves as workers, who identify as workers, who are proud of that status, and believe deeply in the American dream. We also saw uh, that only 10% of these households were claiming even a penny from our nation's cash welfare system. So a word about the welfare system uh, before I go to the book. Uh, uh, one of the chapters is provocatively titled, uh, Welfare is Dead. Uh, it charts the decline of welfare since welfare reform. We used to have about 5 million uh, adults on the rolls in 1996. Uh, we are now down to 1 million adults on the rolls. Half of those are in just two states, California and New York, leaving the rest of the country to absorb just 500,000 adults and their dependent children. Uh, it used to be that 10 have touched the lives of about 70% of poor adults with, and children. Uh, now it touches the lives of about 23%. In some Maryland counties, the percentage of poor children who are touched by TANF is as low as 9%. So uh, welfare uh, is almost definitely dead. Uh, I was talking to uh, a, a staff member of Orrin Hatches the other day. Uh, we did a, a Senate testimony a couple of weeks ago, and she was helping to organize the hearing. And uh, the person who was prepping me said, say something nice about welfare, um, you know, so she won't get mad at you. And so I tried to say, well, welfare reform was a mixed bag. And, and I do believe that, by the way. I do believe that there were many positive things about welfare reform, and we could talk about them in the Q&A. And she said, are you kidding? I read your book. It's a disaster. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my research partner, Luke Schaefer, I uh, just did a webinar with all of the, uh, the state and local uh, welfare uh, uh, department coordinators, and, uh, and the, the moderator said, uh, does what you're seeing in this book fit your experience? And to a person, they said yes. Uh, you know, our, our, our main cash safety net it is really shredded. Um, so when you combine the shredded safety net uh, with uh, the degrading nature of work. Uh, it's not that work in itself is degrading, uh, but the quality of the jobs, uh, the availability of full-time employment, uh, work conditions, 
uh, labor law violations have all become uh, much more in intensified, even over the last 15 years, and the affordable housing crisis. You sort of have a perfect uh, storm, both pulling people into $2 a day poverty and keeping them there. So the selection that I've chosen to read for you is from Jessica Compton in Johnson City, Tennessee. And what I think her story illustrates is the work of survival, how uh, intensively uh, people work uh, just to get by and how all-consuming that is. Uh, I will tell you that people actually can't live without cash. It turns out that you have to have cash to buy your kids socks and underwear, to pay the light bill, uh, to um, uh, make sure your kids have some uh, money for the school bus and so on. And so what parents end up doing to generate that little bit of cash uh, to just get them through and, and help them uh, make those minimal purchases is, is really uh, quite compelling. And Jessica, her husband Travis, and their two little girls, um, Rachel and Blythe, are examples of folks that are working very hard at the work of survival. So I'm going to read from chapter four, By Any Means Necessary. Uh, by the way, this book, part of the book was excerpted by the Atlantic Monthly, and it has had, I don't know what we're up to, we're, we're over 100,000 Facebook shares, I, I think, at the moment. So somehow, this has really gotten people. There's no money to be made selling blood anymore, but you can sell plasma, a component of blood that is used in a number of treatments for serious illnesses. Selling plasma is so common among the $2 a day poor that it might be thought of as a lifeblood. It is legal to donate up to two times a week, for which Plasma Bank will pay you around $30 a time, $60 total. I will say that plasma sales in the U.S. are up from about 10,000 in 2005 to 23,000 just five years later in 2010. In Johnson City, Tennessee, 21-year-old Jessica Conten donates plasma as often as 10 times a month, as frequency, frequently as the law allows. Plasma Biological Services, the local donation center, is located in a one-story white building fronted with plate glass with the business name spelled out in large red letters. Jessica is only, able, is only able to donate when her husband, Travis, has the time to keep an eye on their two young daughters. Rachel and Blythe. He can do that pretty frequently these days because he's been out of work since the beginning of December when McDonald's reduced his hours to zero in response to slow foot traffic. It's nearly February now. Upon arriving at Plasma Biological Services, Jessica checks in. A regular donor, she can bypass the initial time-consuming full-on health screening. Instead, she proceeds to kiosk, rhythmically clicking the mouth to answer the required questions about her health. Quote, when you get there, they have you fill out 22 questions. They ask you about your health and like if you've had any recent tattoos or been in jail or had any piercings lately. Yeah, if you got a tattoo or something, you got to tell them. And then you got to wait like six months and then they let you come back. Travis has too many tattoos and doesn't remember the exact times and places he acquired all of them details that the plasma center requires. He says he has been told he, quote, need not come by to donate. After completing these initial steps, Jessica sits in the waiting room listening for her name to be called. Then, quote, they take your blood pressure and your temp. And then if everything is okay, you wait and get your finger pricked to test for your iron and your protein and stuff. Usually it'd be during my time of month that my iron really goes down. Lately, the iron pills Jessica has tried haven't been working. This terrifies her because donating is the cash bedrock of the family's finances right now. The phlebotomist in charge of the finger pricking has told her that, quote, if the iron pills don't help, it means I could be like anemic. Anemics are barred from donating. Today, like other days, she's nervous. What will happen if she's not allowed to give plasma? The family desperately needs the $30. They are three months behind on the rent. Travis often stands at the kitchen window of their cramped one-bedroom apartment as if transfixed, on the lookout for the sheriff, who might show up at any time to evict them. 
Jessica says, quote, usually they tell me to wait because my blood pressure is always up, so I usually have to wait. They make you wait an extra 10 minutes just to see if it goes down. After failing the test the first time, Jessica sits for a while, taking deep, calming breaths before getting retested. When we asked why her blood pressure nearly always registered too high initially, she says, quote, I don't know, it must be stress, being nervous about my iron levels or something. Once Jessica passes all the tests, she proceeds to the back room, where she's directed to a recliner. Quote, it's just like a big open space with a lot of chairs in there, like machines and stuff. You go back there, and that's when they just hook you up. Today she's brought along a Nicholas Sparks novel she checked out of the library. Quote, I'm always bringing a book with me. A technician feels around for her vein with a plastic glove finger. Once the vein is located, the technician squeezes out some iodine and with a Q-tip begins spreading the thick liquid in a small circle, slowly widening the circle and rubbing the spot for about 30 seconds, staining Jessica's forearm brown. She positions the IV, snaking it around Jessica's wrists over the inner part of her forearm. A needle, banded in green with two small flaps like wings, is inserted into the vein. Quote, I can't never look at it. I never look at it when they do it. They do it right here, she says, pointing to the obvious indentation at the crease in her arm, which looks somewhat like a, somewhat like a drug track line. Many among the $2 a day poor bear these small scars from repeated plasma donations. She then contracts her fist to, fist to start the blood flowing and keeps contracting it at intervals to keep the purplish liquid moving down the tube to the machine that will separate her blood from her plasma. The goldish liquid is extracted and preserved while her blood and platelets are returned to her system. First an extraction, then a return, another extraction, and so on. While it's happening, quote, you just got to sit there as the tube flows yellow, then red, back and forth. For the usual person, it takes about 45 minutes, but for Jessica, it takes well over an hour. She is just over the minimum weight of 10, 110 pounds. The procedure takes a toll, she says, quote, I get tired, especially if my iron's down. I get, like, really tired. She describes the rest of the process as follows. Quote, then you go up to the front and you get a slip of paper and they put your money in a card. Then you just go home. It's like a debit card, like a prepaid. The ritual takes roughly three hours door to door. Even so, the payoff is good, relatively speaking, $10 an hour. As long as her iron, blood pressure, and temperature are okay, she'll donate as often as she is legally allowed. But no one can reasonably think of twice a week plasma donation as a job. It's a survival strategy, one of many operating well outside the low-wage job market. So I'll leave it there and entertain your questions. Obviously, I've given you just a taste, but we don't want to tell you too much because we want the Ivy Bookstore to, to have a brisk business. <laughs> Well, it had, I mean, the, the field work had a huge impact on me. So uh, Winston wanted to know um, whether this, we, we were surprised by the impact. Uh, the live feed doesn't get to hear the questions, so I'm repeating them up here. Yeah, I mean, I've done uh, work in low-income communities for years. Uh, I spent three years living in America's poorest uh, community, uh, Camden, New Jersey, to write my books uh, with Marie Gafalis and Tim Nelson on the family, and, and this, this took a toll on me. So um, I don't know, you know, it was hard to, to know whether Americans would really respond with, with compassion or, or uh, um, a fear and, and kind of a wanting uh, to turn away. And I think we've really been encouraged by the, the degree of compassion. Uh, I think part of that is that one of the surprising things for sort of lay people is how much you know, like ordinary people, the $2 a day poor are, particularly in their desire to work, uh, their history of work, 
uh, and their identification as workers and as taxpayers. One wouldn't think that you would be proud of being a taxpayer, but, uh, but the poor in America, at least in the contemporary period, uh, many of them have been exposed to work, in part because of welfare reform. It pushed a lot of folks who hadn't worked uh, into the labor market, and, and this has created a, a very positive valence on work, uh, and a very positive valence on work as a means of participating in society. how hard it was for you all to get people to actually open up to you and let you follow them around for a year and let you into their lives and I mean that's a huge invasion on for to them I would think and I just I'm it's amazing that you were able to do that yeah so in each city we took uh, a kind of a slightly different tack in in Chicago, where I lived in the, in the summer of 2012, uh, we hired a, a young uh, African-American uh, student who was just graduating from college uh, from a, a South Chicago high school. And he really went through the yearbook and contacted as many of his fellow graduates as possible from that high school. You know, it was near the Englewood community. Uh, and asked them whether anyone that they knew fit this profile. And uh, you know, sadly, um, it, it ended up being several uh, folks that were actually part of his own uh, inner circle. Uh, he didn't have to look very far. We also worked with a very fine um, Hispanic serving community organization on the west side of Chicago, which I can't name or you would be able to identify uh, the people that we wrote about. Uh, but through those agencies, we were really, uh, through the agency and also through uh, the young man we hired, we were able to, to uh, establish trust. You know, uh, many of you probably work in the charitable sector here in Baltimore, and uh, you know that oftentimes these organizations have put 20, 30 years into really building trust in communities. So we unabashedly built on that trust. Uh, but families really like this. You know, it's, uh, many families had never told their stories. Um, many of them had fantasized about writing a book. Uh, many told us uh, that uh, the experience of being interviewed was deeply meaningful and that if they could help just one person with their story, their suffering would have been worth it, which I thought was a pretty astonishing statement. Uh, when we went down to, um, to Johnson City, Tennessee, we hired a very, very gifted folklorist to work with us, and she was literally uh, walking the streets looking for people sleeping in their cars. And again, you know, getting, getting uh, that was maybe the toughest place to really establish rapport. Uh, you know, deeply mistrustful people, often uh, peop very rural people. And I think the fact that I grew up, you know, in, in rural Minnesota maybe helped a little. Um, but, but we had to work pretty hard to get Jessica and Travis's touch. I think we visited them ten times uh, before we really felt uh, that they were open and comfortable with us. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, we actually were doing a survey um, for another purpose, and these were just families who fell into our sample. Um, that's where Ray McCormick and, and Paul Heckwilder came from. And then in, um, in Johnson City, Tennessee, uh, we enjoyed the support uh, of, an, of one uh, TFA teacher who actually appears in the book, Mark Patton, who had very deep roots in the community, and uh, a, a group of, of community leaders who were just exceptional. They had uh, kind of pooled all their money and were trying to uh, run an after-school program for some of the kids in the community, and actually had spent, sent a couple kids to Spelman and to Colorado College you know, from this tiny Delta town. Uh, so in each, in each case, we really tried to, uh, to find people who had deep roots in the community and piggyback on that trust. Uh, but it did take a long time. And, uh, you know, that tells you something about how isolated the people that you're interviewing really are. She's coming with the mic. When you signed a book for me, I told you I was giving it to my three rich granddaughters. And then you said 100,000 people had answered on Facebook. And I wondered, do you feel that young people really know what is going on with people who are not well off? I mean, there are lots of charitable organizations, but are kids in their 20s really aware of all this? 
I think as a society, we're becoming less and less aware of this because we're becoming more and more segregated. Uh, we are now more segregated residentially than we'd ever been before in measured history. This is an absolutely stunning fact. Uh, in the Mississippi Delta, uh, we were, you know, there are no, in many of these towns, uh, there's a white town part and a black uh, part of town, but many of these kids have uh, virtually no experience uh, with Caucasians. Uh, one story we tell about Tabitha Hicks and her sixth grade class is uh, a, a school trip organized by, this, by three TFA teachers to Washington, D.C. And these kids had never been on an airplane. They'd never been out of the Delta. Uh, they had to make an emergency trip to Walmart because it turned out that most of the kids didn't have more than one change of clothing. And of course, that wouldn't uh, do for a, a seven-day trip. Uh, they had never, most kids had never seen an elevator before. They truly thought uh, the teachers were trying to play a trick on them. Uh, they were stunned when it was white people on the, on the mall who would talk to them and, and greet this little band of sixth graders. And, and as they got back on the airplane uh, to, you know, to go back to Mississippi, uh, there was just this pall. And uh, you know, the teachers, uh, Mark Patton especially, uh, you know, was what's going on? These kids seem angry with me. And, and finally, one uh, Tabitha pipes up and said, how can you show us all this and just take us back to the Delta where there's, where there's nothing? Um, so uh, I, I do think it's, it, it, we have to work hard, right? We have to work hard to make that connection. Uh, some of us grew up in a time uh, when uh, you know, the rich and poor were in much closer proximity to one another. Some of us uh, lived in small towns where the rich and the poor went to the same schools, the churches participated, synagogues participated in the same institutions. And that is becoming less and less true, especially uh, for young people coming of age. But I have to say, uh, we have a couple undergraduates here, especially a couple right in the middle there who were actually interns on this project, Lauren and Marnie who spent the summer driving around Baltimore neighborhoods and got to know uh, the poor and the extreme poor. So I think uh, Hopkins is a place where you can uh, send your children and grandchildren and, and we'll keep them safe, um, but, but they'll know, they'll know. Does the book address the disparities in income and uh, draw any comparisons and offer any solutions? Mm -hmm. So we do have qu quite, a, you know, for an academic book, we have quite a robust policy chapter. We, um, we gathered uh, a, a group of uh, 12 to 14 policymakers uh, on the Hill uh, for a day-long conference. Everyone read the book. We had uh, uh, Luke Tate from uh, the Obama administration. We had representatives from Catholic Charities, Lutheran Charities, uh, many, the uh, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, Center for American Progress. Uh, we were a little bit less left-leaning, but we also had the AEI there. So those of you who are conservative, we love you too. And we sat and really hammered out, you know, uh, what could be done. And so uh, you'll see that there's, there's quite a, ro a robust set of, of ideas, but of course there you know, this is agenda-setting book, so we don't get too much into the weeds. On our website, uh, we're much more, more weedy. Uh, but I think in your question, what I heard is, is uh, how do the $2 a day poor uh, in the United States compare uh, with the $2 a day poor around the world? So if you talk to people over at the School of Public Health, uh, some of my wonderful colleagues, uh, where I gave this lecture uh, several months ago, uh, they say to a person, well, it's much worse to be poor in the United States than in the third world because uh, you're so separated from society. It's such a, a source of scorn and shame yeah, to be poor here uh, because of that, that separation and, and that stripping of, of dignity, almost a stripping of, of citizenship that the poor often experience here. Um, we do have uh, frightening health disparities. Uh, you've probably heard about this if you've been around Hopkins for any period of time. Uh, from the richest uh, census tract in our region to the poorest, there's about a 20-year discrepancy, I believe, in, in longevity. Uh, and so uh, some of our poorest citizens are experiencing longevity that you really only see in some countries in, in the developing world. Uh, we have uh, the highest incarceration rate in the, in, in the world, uh, and we have uh, exposure to violence and trauma that is 
uh, that is, uh, you know, reprehensible and that we know about all too well here in Baltimore. So um, the good things about the United States are we have a very uh, robust food stamp program, and this is enormously valuable to folks. Uh, the downside is that the first thing that goes when you need the socks and the underwear and the light bill paid are your food stamps. Food stamp trafficking is rare among the just plain poor, but among the $2 a day poor it is ubiquitous because that's the only currency. And you only get about 50 to 60 cents on the dollar, leaving uh, almost ensuring really that your family will be going hungry uh, two to two and a half weeks out of the month if you choose that, that strategy. Uh, but you can't barter away your health care. Uh, virtually every household among the $2 a day poor has someone in the household uh, with a government-sponsored health uh, care package. Uh, and those folks are coming to clinics. They are, uh, we think, getting care. Robert Moffert, an economist here at Hopkins, is going to do a really in-depth look at exactly the kind of health care utilization we see. Uh, but that's a good thing because, uh, you know, it could be very, very costly indeed if you combine uh, this highly traumatic you know, way of living uh, with, with no access to health care. So we are lucky here. We're, we're fortunate people. Uh, the, the, the charitable uh, sector is probably something else I could mention. Uh, we have a much richer charitable sector than in Europe, partly because of our tax laws, um, or anywhere really in the English-speaking world, and more of a charitable sector, obviously, than in the developing world. Uh, the only problem is that the richest places tend to have the richest charitable sectors. So places like uh, Chicago have a much richer sector than places like Cleveland, which are better off than Johnson City, Tennessee, leaving uh, the Mississippi Delta with virtually nothing in terms of a charitable sector. So in some ways, the charitable sector, while vital, uh, can actually exacerbate inequality rather than, than reduce it. post-TANF world, you've met people and you were surprised by their desire to work. But I have to say that when I was on welfare in the 70s, um, everyone that I knew was desperate to work. Everyone, even when it didn't make sense, even when they would lose money by working. So um, it, it proved to me, and I was surprised at the time, that more generous benefits did not actually persuade people not to work. They yeah. still wanted to work so desperately. So in uh, the 19, uh, early 1990s, when we went around the country interviewing uh, low-income single mothers about uh, welfare and low-wage employment, indeed, the desire to work was strong. Uh, but you also heard a narrative about a trade-off. Uh, can I really be a good parent and a worker? And mothers worried, especially if they were taking uh, jobs that they knew uh, wouldn't allow them to make ends meet. And back in those days, right, you would lose your Medicaid if you went to work, so there was, which you don't now. So uh, there, was, there was a real sense that this job really had to be solid, especially if you're going to leave your kids in the care of strangers. This is especially for mothers, obviously, with very young children. Uh, that narrative uh, has really turned itself around, and I think it's, it's changed for all women. Whether we're um, self-justifying or whether it's true, uh, most of us uh, believe that work is good. Uh, we don't think that it harms our kids. Uh, and uh, we go to work pretty quickly, uh, w even when our children are very young. And what welfare recipients now say is, uh, of course I have to work. How can I value, uh, model the value of education to my children if I don't work? So. Uh, I, I do not mean to say that prior to welfare reform, we had a group of people isolated from the world of work. That was uh, not true. The average welfare recipient uh, was just on for two years at a time, and they were usually off for a job. So uh, there was a lot of fluidity on welfare, just as you say, in the early days. Um, but certainly now, um, the, the idea that, uh, you know, that you can sort of feel okay, even about staying on welfare for two years is really not uh, as much part of the cultural narrative. And, the, and there's a stronger uh, sense both of stigma and of a, a sort of a desire to make a quick transition uh, to employment. So for better or worse, I think that there has been somewhat of a cultural shift in that direction. Uh, 
Um, I'm curious about the overlap between families like these that you studied and families experiencing homelessness and what's really keeping these families from being homeless. Well, many of our families are homeless. All of them are unstably housed. Uh, many of them, uh, you know, because when you don't have any money, you can't afford the rent. And the only exceptions really are people in hard unit public housing. And, you know, only about 20% of our poor get, a, get any kind of assisted uh, housing in the U.S. because it is not an entitlement. Uh, so for the rest, uh, you know, you're moving between shelters, your car, uh, very, very low quality sort of gray market housing. I can remember Jennifer Green, uh, her unit, uh, the, uh, kind of a beaten up trailer on the edge of the road, you know, in this tiny little town in Mississippi. Uh, no power except a cord running into the woods to another trailer. Uh, no source of heat. Uh, part of the roof collapsed, covered with a tarp. Uh, and you see these multiple perilous double ups. Often with mothers unable, uh, mothers and fathers unable to, uh, to exercise much discretion in whose couch they surf on. So what this does to children, right, is it puts them sort of at risk over and over again uh, with multiple adults. And this is where uh, you really see uh, kids traumatized. And in fact, uh, we uh, learned a lot about uh, the ACEs scale, the adverse scale, the adverse childhood experiences scale when we were doing this research. Our families and children uh, usually blew the lid off that scale, and many times it was because of trauma they had experienced because they could not afford a room of their own. Hi. Um, earlier this month, two Princeton economists released research that uh, showed that white Americans were dying at an unprecedented rate um, in, in, um, in America, obviously, and they, were, um, they found that their causes were uh, primarily suicide and substance abuse that was fueling their the, the, mm -hmm. the, the death. And I was wondering how that research, which was uh, one of the uh, researchers was a Nobel Prize winner, how that research sort of contrasts with your work and, and, dove, and or dovetails with it, with your work. Thank you. So this is work by Angus Deaton and Ann Case at Princeton, uh, really uh, looking at white men in Georgia. And uh, they do indeed see uh, early death in, in, in very alarming rates. And uh, they can only speculate as to the causes. They're mere economists. Uh, they're not lucky enough to be sociologists. Uh, we go out and talk to people, and we figure out what's really going on. Uh, so we have a brilliant young graduate student here at Hopkins, uh, Robert Francis, who has really taken this on. Uh, but we have uh, been, been interviewing the white working class ourselves, um, Tim Nelson and, and Andrew Cherlin, uh, more centrally. And there is, I think, evidence for the speculation that Deaton and Case are engaging in that uh, the reason these sort of, you know, people my age are engaging in these behaviors is because they grew up under one social compact, right? The social compact that said, here in America, if you work hard, you can get, again, you can get ahead. It doesn't matter what your social origins are. Uh, but they kind of grown up, and, and they, they were young adults uh, during, you know, sort of that compact, but the compact is really shifted in a way where hard work no longer guarantees uh, that you'll, you'll make it and that you'll succeed. Uh, so have, so have, as wages have corroded, uh, men's especially sense of self has really been unmoored. Uh, and in many ways, we were tempted to write a bigger story in $2 a day because uh, especially when we talk, talk about the changing nature of work, many of the things we talk about, um, the condition of the jobs, uh, the unsteady hours, uh, full-time on-call shifts where you're, you have to set aside your whole day, uh, but you're only pulled in to work the hours that your employer absolutely needs you to work. You know, they're, uh, they're very complicated and efficient algorithms for predicting uh, when the foot traffic will be heavy and, and, and uh, and employers can, can use that algorithm to, to increase profits, but at the expense, obviously, of their, of their workforce. Uh, wage theft, incredibly common. Uh, one practice uh, we saw among, among uh, hotel uh, attendants is that employers often make them uh, clean a room before they clock in or clean a room after uh, they clock in. So next time you stay in a hotel, uh, tip your workers well. They make very little money. 
Um, one, I'll just tell you one story. Um, Jennifer Hernandez, uh, we, we found her in a shelter in the west side of Chicago. Uh, she'd been in shelter care for 11 months, desperate to find a job. Uh, she finally, <laughs> and the shelters will say, um, and this is true, you know, at least in Chicago, I'm not sure it's true here in Baltimore, you have three months, you can stay here, and if you don't find a job, uh, you know, and achieve self-sufficiency, you're out. So she had sort of not, uh, not made the self-sufficiency clock at a couple shelters, and she was really desperate to do it this time because she had run out of shelters. And so literally the week before she was about to be evicted, she did find a job at Chicago City Custodial Services. Uh, she loved it. Uh, she began by cleaning, uh, uh, you know, condo complexes, right, between tenants and office buildings. Uh, she felt great uh, having made a measurable difference that day. But as of the uh, spring, adva summer advanced into fall and then into winter, uh, the cleaning company lost those contracts and all that were left were foreclosed homes on the south side of Chicago. So what do we know about foreclosed homes? Uh, first, they're boarded up, you can't see inside. Second, uh, they have no power, no heat, uh, no water, uh, no light. And if you've been in Chicago over the winter, it is colder than it is here in Baltimore. And so uh, Jennifer, of course, is an asthmatic. They never knew in the morning what they would find, you know, a family uh, 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 hanging out, uh, hiding out there. Uh, wildlife, uh, you know, a, a drug den. Uh, it, once they got into the home, of course, they had two buckets of water they'd brought from Chicago City with them, and these tur quickly turned cold and filthy as they scrubbed, and so they'd have to sneak off to a neighbor or to a, uh, to a gas station and kind of avert eye contact as they snuck into the bathrooms and filled their pails and came back uh, to scrub, and of course, uh, these houses have been closed for a long time and the mold and other toxins began to get into Jennifer's lungs and she became very, very ill. Uh, as she began to call in sick, her employer punished her by cutting her hours because she was no longer seen as a reliable worker. Finally, uh, she was down from 35 to 10 hours a week. And since it had taken her uh, 10 hours to find, uh, 10, 11 months to find that job, uh, she felt she had to quit and, uh, and uh, spend all of her time uh, looking for the next job. So uh, that just kind of reflects some of the, uh, the very um, difficult working conditions that some of these folks face. We have time for one more question if we have the hand. Oh, you got your question in. Good. Sometimes these very difficult, heart rending problems uh, don't, uh, the, they don't yield to the obvious straight ahead uh, solutions. Uh, but occasionally they yield to indirect approaches. And I'm just curious if uh, your work brought to mind some alternate strategies. One that springs to mind is, for instance, uh, a more comprehensive uh, daycare infrastructure or perhaps uh, certain types of school reform, which is a little bit removed. But that, that sort of indirect approach. Yeah, so uh, we, we have a sort of a three-pronged uh, set of policy recommendations. Uh, and and I, maybe they're a little surprising. They'll, they'll catch people a little bit by surprise. Uh, rather than advocate for going back to the old, you know, welfare system we had prior to 1990, uh, I think you would agree, B, that uh, this was a miserable system to be on, and it made people feel ashamed, and it robbed them of their dignity and self-respect. Uh, we really uh, have listened to the people uh, that we've been talking to, and and what they want more than anything else is an opportunity to work. They uh, when we asked them what it would require for them to feel they had made it, you know, the, the criteria are, are endearingly modest. They, they talk about, a, you know, 35 hours a week steady, uh, 12, $13 an hour, maybe 14 if you're really shooting the moon. You know, that's only $28,000 a year. And they talk about uh, being able to afford a place of their own so they can raise their families in the way uh, that they would like to. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, both, I think, public sector and private sector approaches, uh, some that have been tried uh, that show real promise in expanding work, uh, but it is a big problem. Even though our official employment rate is now down at 5%, uh, many people are involuntarily underemployed. Uh, many folks who would like to work part-time, full-time are forced into part-time jobs. Uh, many people who want jobs among the less skilled of us uh, can't find them even after tens 
upon tens of job applications. And even when they get them, like Travis Compton, uh, when the foot traffic slows, uh, their hours can easily be reduced to zero. So uh, we really focus on, on, on that in the book. Uh, in terms of indirect approaches, though, I do want to say one thing. One thing we do know, and this is a book that I'm publishing in, uh, on, in, on April 19th uh, of uh, 2016, uh, and partly in comm comm commemoration for, for what happened on that day. Uh, we've been following a group of young people in Baltimore uh, who experienced a dramatic reduction uh, in uh, their neighborhood poverty rates over a period of time. I know this is something that you're personally working on. And what we see is remarkable transformation in their lives. Their mothers didn't end up making any more money. They didn't work more. Uh, the mothers didn't. But the children are showing a remarkably altered trans, uh, trajectory because we blew up, tore down the high rises, and many of these uh, young people ended up in neighborhoods so that, while not ideal, uh, were still far less poor, often 50% less poor uh, than those their parents came of age in. Uh, so th we know that this works. We know that reducing concentrated <laughs> poverty works. It's a huge problem in Baltimore, a big challenge for us. Um, but this is one clear, indirect approach uh, that we should be pursuing for imp increasing opportunity. Thank you very much. to April 19th. That's right. And I'll be out on the, uh, at the book table in case anyone else would like to purchase a book. Thank you all so much.